All right, if everybody can take a seat, please. We're going to get started here in a second. Are we good to go? All right, good evening, everybody. I want to thank you for coming out tonight. My name is Antti Lagarsik. I'm the Communications Officer for the City of Menor. We want to thank the Ohio EPA and our friends at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History for coming out to give us a presentation tonight on the upcoming uh, salt mitigation project that's going to be happening over at the Marsh. Um, and first person up is going to be Dave Crisco with the museum. Yeah, thanks for everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is David Crisco. I'm the guy that, like, and some of these people that are just walking in the door that have been really involved with that restoration. So if you have any problems with the restoration, there the go to the, see them kind of thing. <laughs> just kidding. So I just gonna set the stage, just kind of talking why the marsh was so important. I've got a, a bunch of slides. So that's just one thing. We're gonna have you talk into the microphone because we're already in trouble. Oh, I'm gonna have to like lean this whole time and or just shout at you guys. Oh, I gotta talk to the screen, but oh boy, this is gonna be fun. All right, that's the Wake Robin boardwalk. Uh, out in the marsh there, and a few years ago it looked definitely different. A um, little backstory, you know, it's just a, a marsh. This place is a hot spot for a long time. It's been on people's radar for over a hundred years. Um, and the, you could look. There's the Grand River and the blue line on the right side of that screen, and it, it, it's just an old channel of the Grand River. It used to connect the, right there at Fairport, and then sometimes we have high lake levels and low levels, and we know that the last couple of years we broke the all-time records. And so that just got abandoned. It's about four miles long, that kind of that blue long circle there. Uh, that doesn't even include the, the Lagoons Marine on the far west end there. And um, here's some old, old sl slides. Um, folks might be familiar with Shipman Pond. That's over by the Headland State Park entrance. And th that's a hand-painted slide. Um, this is at the far west end before the marina was put in. Or the, I'm sorry, the Lagoons, Lagoons Marina. Um, you can kind of see the water and some plants there. Here's another hand-painted one. That's this, in the same area where the, the marina's at right now. Um, and then this Corsi of the city, this is a 99-year-old photograph um, in, that, in that western basin. So you see it's kind of a mosaic of open water and emergent vegetation, and, and um, that's the beach ridge in the background there. Um, fast forward to 1960s. And the museum and the Nature Conservancy, Holden Arboretum, a bunch of other conservation organizations, Blackbrook Bird Club, had uh, found out about a plan to kind of make it into a marina or in a golf course and all this, and uh, did a big protection campaign. At the same time, after they had hundreds of $5 donors, they raised money and bought most of the east side of the marsh. When I say east side, I mean like east of Corduroy Road, the middle road going through there. Um, that red spot, there's Corduroy Road on that map there in the center. Um, the red spot is the, is the salt film, and that got put in. And basically, that's 250,000 pounds, plus or minus a couple pounds, tons, not pounds, 250,000 tons of low-grade rock salt and some other, other stuff. But basically, that's from the Morton salt mine. That mine's like, what, 2,400 feet deep? It's just the, the shaft going down underneath there. And it sat on their campus for several years before they finally said, hey, can, let's get this off here. We need that space. And at that time, this was pre-1970, so it was pre-Clean Water Act and all that stuff. And, and somebody that, who, for years, I couldn't say their name, but um, the Osborne family uh, just owned that land, and they put that where that red blob is at, and that's about seven acres. They filled in the Black Brook Creek Valley. That's the name of that creek that you can see coming through there. And within days, the museum's phone went off the hook, just saying that the marsh is dying, the marsh is dying. And there's, the, there's Black Brook Creek zoomed in. So you got Lakeshore Boulevard and State Route 44 there. See it before all the, the homes that got put in. It's about a 30, 35 foot deep creek ravine, and uh, just filled it in with that. And uh, you can see some of the what had happened to the marsh to, to the north up there, all that kind of that patchwork stuff. Here's a, a close up that's looking northwest. That is um, lime kiln dust probably leaching out of there. There's some fill in there, just for the guys that are going to be pulling that out of there. You see the bricks and stuff, just heads up. Um, yeah, fun stuff. And um, here's what it looked like just within a, a year or two of that salt going in. It just killed everything. The museum's phones just it just died. It's just a ton of salt. So um, killed the place and created the perfect tinderbox. Here's looking north. I'm sorry, looking south. That's the salt fill in the upper left-hand corner. You can see the Route 44 exchange there with Route um, 
two in the far northwest corner there. Blackbrook Creek is valley is kind of on the right, the mouth coming in the marsh. And look at that shot down below. It, to me, that looks like all the, it already burned once, I'm guessing, because there were tons of big fires, because there's no branches on those trees. They were just, they look like little matchsticks. And it was the perfect tinderbox for this plant that, that moved in. At that time, this plant is from the Middle East and North Africa. It's called Phragmites. That's what we use it as the, we generally call it. Um, you see it all along our highways. It's salt tolerant. Um, it's all along the, the Tigris, Euphrates rivers, the Nile. Uh, where the, and uh, that fell on the right. Let's say he's six feet. So that's a 12 foot shot there. We had Phragmites out in the marsh that we like to joke, say it was old growth Phragmites. It was 24 feet tall. So twice as tall as that. Um, whew. That was some tall stuff, and it, it just completely, it jumped in, and, and since it's salt tolerant, it took over the marsh. So here's just one big monoculture. That just means one solid plant of Phragmites. This was the biggest Phragmites marsh in the state of Ohio. What a great distinction kind of thing. 800 acres of it. At this point, you can see the landfill has now been capped, and the stream rerouted. So that means um, the stream is no longer flowing through the landfill into Old Black Brook, but it's rather... It's kind of hard to make out on that image, but it's flowing right along that woodlot in what we call New Black Brook. It's just going right into the marsh. And what we didn't know at that time was that the old Black Brook on the top of the screen is sort of the continental divide. When water would hit that, it would go either west toward the marina and or east toward uh, Shipman Pond in Route 44, which is the, image, the road on the bottom there. When it got rerouted in 1987, that all the salt water that's coming out of there, it was kind of low-level brackish. It, um, left the West Basin alone, essentially. That meaning that there wasn't any more salt going that way, which was good news. We didn't know it until the, until one of these fellows really cleaned our clocks. At least 11 large fires where we had to... How many people remember the fires, right? Yeah, a bunch of hands, you can see. Uh, yeah, huge fires because it was... This plant is just a grass and it's just perfect tinder. When these fires would happen often, it, uh, it was when the plant was dead and so you have all those stalks we estimated a billion stalks just by doing some counts on there one stem about every two or three inches you could lean against the stuff we had heavy equipment amphibious vehicles that you had to like back up and drive and just crush it and back up and drive it it was so dense and so strong here's the last big one in 2003 this is the headlands there on the top of the image the lower left is the wake robin boardwalk this burden, the overlook that was there at the Newhouse Pond, Carl Newhouse Pond, that's the boardwalk there in the bottom left, that line going north and south. This made international news. We had museum members in South Korea saw this. This soot came down 20 miles away, this black particulate, um, a doozy of, of a thing. And it, there's what it looked like afterwards. You can see the, they, uh, the boardwalk used to go all the way almost to the links to the golf course there on Links Road. There's the Newhouse Pond, that dark kind of, uh, rectangular looking pond and then the other line that goes at an angle is the the sewer line that was put in in 1966 uh, to replace when it was just open sewage or well primarily treated sewage that went into the marsh uh, and so they toasted the whole place and it's just grass so it doesn't it's everything all the life's underground so it was just just got a fertilizer it just was like this is great thanks and it regrew uh, with a lot of t a lot more phosphorus this time around and so it did this a bunch of times Here's all those, those um, matchsticks I mentioned earlier. Uh, there's the Wake Robin Boardwalk, and you can see the Phragmites has grown up right up through it. Uh, and we were like, oh, great, wonderful, like a $86,000 insurance policy. We decided to replace that boardwalk that same year and also push back the Phragmites. So in 2003, the only tools that we had in our disposal were... Um, like these uh, overpowered weed whips and hedge trimmers, and um, we decided to get to try and do something about it. So we pushed it back, and there's one of our crew using um, uh, what's called a brush cutter. It's like a just an overpowered weed whacker with a circular saw blade. We would go through boots left and right because there's a ton of silica in these frag stalks, and they would just pierce through our boots, um, and you just get cut up. But in the foreground, it was when we pushed it back in 2003. It was all these native plants came out of the soil seed bank. So that's that kind of that, all that greenery in the foreground. Um, and that was that, that aha moment. That, hey, there's hope here. There's actually some native plants. And we reached out to the Lake County Soil and Water Conservation District, and they started testing around and figuring out that that western basin from Blackbrook Creek West 
was mostly freshwater. All the surface salinity had flushed through over between 1987 and 2003. And that's kind of when that we were like, oh, wow, there's some hope here. And it, it kind of got that sparkle and that phoenix arising from the ashes sort of a moment. Um, this is Dr. Jim Bissell on the far left, the guy um, who just retired from the museum last year. And, and he found all sorts of crazy things, rare plants. This plant in these hole in there is called Burry. That's one of our Ubers, one we really wanted to see back. It hadn't been seen there since 1966 and, and so on and so forth. Um, there's the new house pond in the bottom right image. All of a sudden, all these birds start showing up, and all the birders figure that out, and they start showing up along that boardwalk, and um, it'd be a high-traffic area, a real hot spot. This is a, a photo of uh, marsh milkweed that's along the boardwalk there that's taken by our very own Becky Donaldson back there in the corner. Who's, that's her photo. It, it's amazing. We get tons and tons of butterflies. There's some folks here that do a lot of butterfly monitoring, and, and it was just such a magnet for it. And uh, it was like that for several years, and then... Um, then we really had to get serious about this. We had um, realized that a lot of the marshes were in bad shape. They were getting invaded by these non-native plants. And so we put together this plan, and, and it involved herbicide. And back in 2003, a conservation organization used an herbicide. That was not copacetic. Um, so we paid a premium for this aquatic approved. It had been tested on fish and, and aquatic insects and um, paid quite a premium for it. And same, the surfactant is what etches into, this, into that waxy leaf of that Phragmites stalk. And um, uh, and so we used these two together, and um, and then sat over the winter just with an ulcer, going, "Oh my God, what do we do?" You know, we used a herbicide, and um, lo and behold, these guys show up. These are a native frog, and they arrived, they thrived, and they're still here today, uh, despite us using that herbicide. And uh, so we we really got honed it down to try to use the best management practices, because I know a lot of people have concerns about herbicide, and and rightfully so. Um, when you see that image in the bottom left and right, you see, oh my God, they're dumping a ton of herbicide. That's about 85% water in that photograph there coming out of that, that helicopter. Um, helicopters use a little bit hotter mix, but we've got it down to where we're using just 3% of the herbicide. Um, and that was another winter spent with an ulcer going, oh my God, what do we do? I'm a biologist, I'm trying to save nature, and here we are dumping herbicide. But it, it worked, and um, we started getting more and more tools in our toolbox, uh, the eight-wheeled amphibious vehicles in the top, these huge tanks down that could float in the bottom right and left. Um, this is in the beginning. There's the sewer line there, that line going across the left of the screen. Um, that's the marina in the far background in the center top. We had that marsh, hired the marsh master. He came around. He went around three times to get a buffer so we didn't get anywhere near the homes, anywhere near the trees. We tried to do, you know, least harm. And... Uh, there's the Marsh Master. That's the, the old new house overlook and the Wake Robin Boardwalk there in the new house pond. Um, and that's Corduroy Road way, way in the distance there. And then uh, we had such great results in the Western Basin. It, it was taking a little while. We had mashed all that Phragmites down, and it, and it takes Phragmites a long time to, for it to um, break down. The reason we mashed it down, we wanted to get sunlight down in there to hit that soil. Because it turns out that that soil has like 200 species of seeds in it which was pretty cool. And so this is the East Basin. This is just a, a probably 2017 image. Route 44 in the bottom there. Um, you see Corduroy Road in the top center left. Um, and so we, we paid them again to come back out and mash the East Basin. And uh, they were just doing those squares, those kind of IZOD patterns. It's just going around mashing, mashing. Uh, in the far right, we always joke that they got lost, those little curly cues, you know. I spent hours and hours on this thing. When you have 24-foot frag, this is what you see for hours on end. This is all you see is just Phragmites stalks. Fun times. Here's some of the, the, the restoration crew in one of the amphibious vehicles. Um, these are the, I guess you'd call them the, the you know, college students, college graduates that just put that sweat equity and they really want to do restoration. That makes them feel really good. So it was pretty cool. Um, and some Phragmites came out, and they were just doing spot treating. And that's what we've been doing for the last uh, couple of years now is just onesies and twosies, spot treating, spot treating as it comes up. And, uh, and as you'll see in this image, the results are starting to pay off. So here's 2050. That's Corduroy Road, the marina way, way in the upper uh, center along the edge there. And uh, look, this is looking westward. And so we started in about 2014. And you can see the greenery starting to fill in. These are all native plants, uh, almost about 200 native plants, that's, which is pretty amazing. Foreground had just been mashed um, in 2017. And then this next shot is 2019. 
So you can see that the marsh was really starting to recover. And, the, and it was one of these classic cases of building. They'll come. There's tons of wildlife. And I could show you, like, just the, tons of stuff. But we're not out of the woods yet. And I use that as a pun. Um, we like to be in the woods in our profession. But uh, some of the things to watch out if folks are neighbors here. Um, these are some of the uber invasives that are trying to get back in there. Lesser Soundine is blooming right now. You'll see it along the highways. It's a, a new new threat. It, the entire Rocky River Valley, for example, is filled with it. Um, and it disappears as soon as the leaves come out. And you see raw soil. I came in off of um, wh this road. What is this, Heisley? The road right here? That creek valley right over there. You look down into it right now, and it is all green. And it's just this plant. It's just one plant. When you get a monoculture, they get un unstable. It's just monoculture. That's what Phragmites happen. We had these huge monocultures. Purple loose drive was sold in the, uh, the, the landscaping trade because it is a pretty one. But a million seeds per plant, um, it spreads pretty quick. So we've been fighting that battle with that plant. Um, they just, but that's how it goes. There's the, the marsh milkweed again, that picture there. The monarchs have really responded. Um, we're along the lake shore, the, the marshes along the lake shore. So it's just every year more and more and more monarchs and um so people are pick, paying attention to this we, we did plant some plants as, as you read the the stats there but it just becomes sort of a, a wildlife mecca between the lagoons marina uh, nature preserve between the marsh and then headlands and if anybody likes birds this headlands beach is the number one s site in the state it's got the most birds have ever been seen there i think the marsh now is in the top 30. so it's become this ecotourism destination i appreciate the city for putting it putting those grants together. They want to build some overlooks there. That's awesome. Uh, and applaud the city for doing that. Before and after shots, just taking us back what it used to look like with uh, Phragmites on the left, and that's what it looks like on the right today. Um, and here's some of the wildlife came. Becky had sandhill cranes, was it last week? Uh, there are thousands of ducks, uh, literally like probably 5,000 ducks. We've had volunteers estimate that. I just had a drone up last week by an outside firm and they they counted thousands Oops, there, pintail in the top right green wing teal and shoveler in the bottom right they most of these won't stay they won't stay the green wings think about it but i think the eagles get, make them think twice uh the cranes have come through every year now for the last several years april and the fall uh, who knows if they'll stay but um people get very excited about it river otter in the top right beaver have probably always been there bottom right that's a muskrat in the center top. Uh, coyotes are out there. They're feeding on rodents. Uh, and then the mink on the far left, that's been there all along, just hacking it out like the beaver was along the, just along the edges. And then the other great news uh, we, that, um, especially folks at the, uh, the federal level with the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, which helped cover some of the cost on this. This has been a combination of state and federal monies. That's an uh, electroshocking boat there on the right. Well, we did a fish that... We didn't have a record for is that yellow perch there, and the fingerlings are starting to use that as a nursery, which is huge. This is 800 acres. Uh, we've got about 26 species of fish now. We'll be electroshocking May 24th at the marina. You guys are more than welcome to come out and um, see it. Um, we'll put them all on display, and it's just really cool to see all these fish coming. And the anglers get it. Um, they want to catch this one. This is a, uh, nowadays is a small one. If you look at, uh, it's hard to see. I don't have a laser pointer, but there's eggs dribbling out of her. It's kind of back by his, uh, gosh, it's really hard to see behind those those fins there, in front of that, that last fin by his, his uh, what would that be, his right hand, there's a little fin, and then right just in front of those are eggs. She was born at the marsh, uh, and she came back to lay eggs there. And so it's, this past year we caught a 40-inch pike. So, you know, the fish stories there. I have photos of it. I should should have put it in there. But um, that's a pretty cool story there, and lots of other fish that are that are there as well. And that's from the marina right there. Um, other things that we had and lost, these two turtles. Uh, the left's the spotted, the right's the blandings. Um, maybe someday that we'll um, get them back. But if you do see one, please let us know. And then final, just a shout out for the, we've got the Nature Center there on Corridor Road. Um, come say hi. It's open on the we every weekend now through, through the summer into the fall. So um, that's all I got. Any questions? Otherwise... All right, thanks. All right. All right, we'll get you set up uh -oh. over here. Some qu one
expand the plant? Oh, sorry. Yep. So the, the, you know, would it behoove the city to, to spray or ban? Is that what your, the question was? Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's a it, it's a tough one. We had multiple landowners out there. There's about um, 90 different land parcels out there originally, and multiple landowners. And we've slowly been fundraising to purchase the land in the marsh. But how do you deal with it when it's outside and it's on private property? It's like this national problem, but it's private property. So it's it's working. It's educating every one of you, you every one of you being an ambassador, and and pointing out that that plant can wreak havoc. Uh, it's treated along the route, the ODOT road right away. Um, because it clogs up all their ditches. When this started making news, news, um, some of the uh, newspaper articles, we got calls from ODOT, Lake County ODOT. We've worked with quite a bit. Um, Ashtabula ODOT. They would. They're like, this plane is killing us because it plugs our ditches and it floods the road. And and uh, yeah, I, I can't speak for the city, but it definitely takes um, a lot of people. And it's a, it's not an easy plant to kill. But there are companies that do it. Um, that I could recommend uh, Crowley's Weed Management. Um, Davy Resource Group. Uh, there's other that we've used in uh, ecological field services. That that's their specialty. They've got the herbicide applicators license. They know native plants, good plants, bad plants, um, and they come out and can treat that and and use those best management practices to help. Hope that answered your question. Oh yes. Hey, <laughs> and I know where you live. So um, yeah. Hey, yeah. They've been off the charts, and I um, we've. Two years ago on that landfill, we were out there across from your house, and uh, and, w and during broad daylight, we were getting hammered by the mosquitoes. And uh, one of our guys identified it, and it's called a cattail mosquito. It's a native mosquito. Uh, and then last summer was just horrendous. It turns out this mosquito, it's a different life cycle. I know this isn't the answer you want to hear, but basically when the um, Lake County Health Department does the... the um, the spray, they put, uh, I think one of them is Dimlin, and I forget what the other one is, They on the surface, and mosquito larvae come up to the surface and can't either can't breathe or they die from it. It's a non-selective. It kills any aquatic insect. Um, this mosquito doesn't come to the surface to breathe. It drills into cattails and phragmites. So if we can get the, we had, we've had some outbreaks of cattail, um, f the far western basin. We're not done in the east basin. Especially along Route 44, where it's saltiest, is our Achilles heel right now. We've been, we've mostly got the far, the western basin done. The far west around the marina, there's some of this cattail. Um, it's the game of whack-a-mole for us trying to get the cattail because all this turns out that most of our cattail that's out there is not native as well. It's a hybrid or an invasive. But I know that doesn't help you. We're trying. If we can get the cattail on the frag, that'll really that'll help quite a bit. Um, and, and, and so I've talked to the health department, the folks that do the, the spraying, and um, they said Manor's got quite a bit of mosquito species. And some of them are non-native, salt-tolerant ones. Um, there was a study done in the early 70s, and it found that cattail mosquito even in the early 70s. It, some of it's because it's such a disturbed system. It's out of balance. If we can get it, now that we're getting it back in balance, we start getting all the critters back in there and that whole food chain, and hopefully that'll and get rid of the, the cattail and the phragmites. That'll help with the mosquitoes. What about the... Uh in predators for the mosquitoes are they increasing or yeah and you're in a hot spot because his i don't want to throw you under the bus but your house is in old blackbrook creek valley and so you're hasn't really had that chance to flush out with fresh water i'm not sure i don't know if dan can speak to that in the yeah probably not you know it's it's tough because you have a landfill that's leaching into you know you know there's that dead zone right right at the base of the landfill um at that at that toe um and, and i was gonna pull the, the image but so yeah that that creates the a challenge because the predators the, the mud minnows and the salamanders and all the uh, other insects they're getting what's the ph of the lime kiln dust oh probably close to 10 11. super caustic so it's frying all the insects that would eat the mosquito larva too as well The, the last couple of years? Yeah. Where's, um, you, yeah? The mosquitoes were bad everywhere last year, though, across all of northeastern Ohio. So I would be anywhere in the field, and I'd come to the marsh, and there was no difference. 
So I know you live there, but we live in Eastern Lake County, and I work in Portage County, where my home office is, and they're bad everywhere last year. So we're hoping for a good year this year. Yeah, especially since we're going to yank this landfill out. We don't want all that water going into the open, open landfill. So, yes, sir. Yeah, goes through our fabric. Um, yeah. And uh, there's a, yeah, there's there's a lot of species, and uh, yeah. Wish all, right, I could. all right, folks, we're going to move along with this. Um, we're going to get the presentation from the Ohio EPA, and as soon as they're done, we're going to have a Q and A session. So whatever questions you have, we could just shout them out at that time. Uh oh, now I'm in trouble. Well, to begin with, thanks. I wanted Dr. Kriska to lead in because what we are doing is a restoration. So even though it involves a lot of construction, the goal is this is a restoration and we know it's been a long time coming and uh, we'll kind of go through things and uh, discuss where we are. My name's Bill Zawiski. I've been with the Ohio EPA. Most people say way too long, but it's over 33 years now. Um, and this is a partnership of many, many people. So this is not just Ohio EPA's project. It's a county project. It's the city project. It's the museum. It's DNR. It's all of us working together. And without that, we would not be where we are and be able to hopefully, at the end of all this, expand and help uh, mitigate some of the stuff that we're seeing still impacting the marsh. Long, long history. So we think the fill activities took place in 66. Um, chances are there was stuff that still occurred afterwards, but um, in the 1980s, um, the US EPA did an information request from the Osborne companies. And from what we understand, uh, that's when fill activities, it immediately started being a problem. And in 1970, uh, a report came out talking about the impacts that were going on. Now, Ohio EPA was formed in 1972. The Clean Water Act, which is the, the, the version of the law we use, came out in 1972. So a lot of this stuff predates even Ohio EPA. Um, in the 80s, we saw a lot of sampling. In the 90s, it was kind of quiet because the Things had been capped, and I think it was just waiting up for that next big time to start kicking stuff out. And in, in the 2000s, we started getting involved again because our attempts at it. So when Ohio EPA tries to address contamination, we have a staged approach. We first ask nicely because it works in everyone's favor if we all work on this together. If that doesn't work, we start doing more and more studies because it's going to end up we're not going to ask nice. <laughs> and that's where we ended up here is from this time we were asking uh, initially nice and then it ended up that it, it ended up as an attorney general's office court order. So we started nice and we didn't end up there. And in 2019, that is when this order came out and it had specific things that, that it required. So let's kind of look at this history. Uh, Dr. David had kind of shown some of it, but this is a, I, I took all of this off the Lake County uh, GIS site. So these GIS sites are so cool. I never grew up with GIS in school, and now the stuff you can see is amazing. So that is the brook in its original alignment. And I tried to keep that circle fairly consistent. That's the location of the marsh. In 1951, and then in 59, and this was when I was reading some of the stuff, this was one of the years there was uh, some die-off of trees. I think that's the year they said there was this massive tree die-off. Um, but the brook is still where it's at. In 1973, that is the fill, and the brook is no longer there. <laughs> so this fill pushed that brook to the side, and then ultimately, we'll show a little bit, it was culverted. We start seeing the expansion of this area that nothing was growing. So it's already impacting the marsh, and it's immediately got this no one grows here kind of thing going on. 
1985. So during this time, there were attempts at covering it with some of this mix of ash and kiln dust and then ultimately a soil covering to try and keep this from, from going out, which, which creates some of our problems because now that's more stuff that has to be moved. The earliest studies from the 1971 on recommended always removing the material. So that was something consistent no matter who was looking at it, the end re recommendations were remove the material. Well, in 1991, we still see those impacts going on. Still 94. Now you can see a road coming in, and that's where the houses are off of Deer Ridge now. In 2000, 2004, it's still there. You go to 2007. And I, did, what, were you doing cattail stuff here? That's our trailer. <laughs> so, so this is the, mu the museum really working on controlling those invasives. And then this is the most recent one, which is, if you go out there today, that's kind of how it looks. So some of our historic photos from the 1980s, these were the erosional rills and the material coming out the sinks. So as material eroded away or settled, we had sinks. They culverted the stream, and that directed some of that into the marsh, and that was on that would have been on the left side of the fill to the west. And in 1980, so for me, because I'm old, a lot of these people were original EPA employees that walked through this, and one of my old professors uh, was the consultant for the Osborne Company. This is the culvert. They walked the entire length of the culvert under the fill. And all that stuff is the salt leaching out. So that culvert, what was meant to happen is what, you know, what the intent was, um, execution we can debate, but the intent was to isolate the material, right, so that it doesn't come down, but it found crevices in between the pipe joints, and that's where the salt was coming in. Another divot. And then some of what you were talking about of, of these leachate outbreaks, this is when we started getting back involved and really up in our monitoring program. In 2006, we had a lot of folks doing a lot of work out there because these things were popping out. And this is still, if you look along the side, you can still see remnants of these. Um, so Ohio EPA in 2007 and 2010 did some more work around the marsh. We knew this was not going to end up in that nice handshake deal where we all agree to clean it up. So we started doing a series of studies. One is called a phase one, and that's where we go through the history, ownership, impacts to the site, and write a report on it. So if anyone works in a commercial business, a phase one you always do before you buy property. Well, the second step of that is if your phase one says there might be something icky out there, then you do what they call the phase two, where you poke a bunch of holes or collect data and figure out what's going on. So this was from Ohio EPA's phase two, where all, each dot represents a place where we put a boring. So we pounded through and wanted to see what the layers of stuff were. And what that ended up is, there's kind of an outside blue and an inside smaller polygon. The outside was kind of the area of ash and kiln dust that was used to initially cover the salt. The smaller, and it has a lot more uh, straight lines in it, that's the area that we think is the salt. Now understand, this is not perfect because it's all drawn from those individual points. So the more points you put in, the more you can refine this. But this is an estimate, and this is, we were going to, all right, this is not going to end well, meaning it's going to end up in a legal settlement. We have to be able to tell the judge how much material is there, because ultimately in the remediation process, we're asking for this to be removed. So we had to have an idea. So that. That ended up being where we ended up, which comes out to about that 200,000 plus cubic yards of stuff that needs to be addressed. The consent decree. 
This is what I said was filed and uh, we started years and years before. This is not something, when, when you start getting into legal wranglings, years go by. And, and this is where we ended up. All this stuff, uh, you can go online and, and get it off the court. Um, so, $10.6 million for the site remediation. The property was donated, so we wanted the Osborne and the successors to have no control of that. Currently, the property rests with the Lake County Land Bank, the Land Reutilization Corporation. After remediation, the intent is to get that property transferred to the museum. So the museum doesn't do remediation. The land bank is set up to do that stuff because they inherently accept the risk. So that's why we're doing this stage thing. So our job is to clean it up, and then ultimately the goal is that it becomes part of the museum's holdings in the larger Mentor Marsh area. Um, now this is, you see a bunch of really fine lines on the bottom and there's this purple area that's the fill and there's some fine red lines that is the outline of the original creek valley uh, that dr crisco was talking about so it's a fairly steep valley and when you would overlay the properties right now if you know where the gate is the first three properties to the left of that gate are probably partly on the edge of that creek bank so when we're looking at, hey, it'd be really swell to restore the creek to its original bank, I'm going to guess that the property owners along those properties would not think the same. So our adjustments have to take into account what is currently out there and how, how our property is aligned right now. Part of what we are able to do, because Ohio EPA has the money, that means we were kind of going to be the project managers for doing this. Um, we do this occasionally, but this is a big thing. So we were fortunate to have the Ohio Facilities Commission, so the ones that from the state of Ohio oversee building buildings and big things, they're used to running contracts. And so they had uh, their contract engineer develop a scope of work that we put out for bid. And this was it. And the big goals we have are to take the stuff out, <laughs> to restore this many acres, and then it included all the little points, access road and the project management costs. So this, this are the big tickets. This is known as a design build. So there's two ways of doing contracts. One, let's say you would have an architect draw up a house. And then you hire a builder. Well, they build it exactly the way the architect drew it up. Which for a structure is an absolutely wonderful way of doing it. For a restoration, it is not because we don't know exactly how this is set. We don't know everything about this site. So this concept of design build or adaptive, we are able to adapt to changes and the contractor then works with us. We still have a scope and we still have a budget. So those are the big things. We wanna knock off the things on the scope of work and remain in budget, but to get there, there is not just one way. We can adapt to it. Now we have goals and concepts that are, we're going to follow, but if little hiccups of things that are unforeseen come up, we have the ability to respond to those. So for restoration, we find uh, that this is a very good way of going, this design build, because it allows us to adapt to changes and work with your team. This was bid out. We have a contractor that was awarded and that was Great Lakes and their team. They did a map of current site conditions, and if you've walked there, you know exactly what this says. It's flat, and then it goes down into the marsh. And underneath that flat part is a bunch of stuff that we're going to take out. So those are the current site conditions. The goal is to make it look something like this. This is going to be, uh, if you remember, the, the creek valley that Dr. Kriska talked about where all those lines are on the bottom, that's the slope down to a new creek valley because the original creek valley, as I mentioned, would intrude into many of the private properties. So our creek valley, because of that, is going to have to be shifted a little to the north. And so this is where, with the design build, we can work together 
to this is the target, but that doesn't mean it's going to be exactly like this. We want to work with everyone to achieve the goals of the project and stay within our budget to make sure we can achieve something that's going to ultimately be the restoration. So where we are, we are having weekly meetings um, at the, uh, with the team. We do not have a final location. The, the bid came in for material management, and I am assuming at this Friday's meeting we may know where this stuff is going. So right now, I do not know. The intent is to begin, well, the project's already begun because we've got the design and we've got all this stuff, but to actually get in the site and start moving material, the goal is to do it starting in May, to have it complete, so all the stuff out as soon as possible to make the minimum amount of annoyance <laughs> for those that have this in their backyards. Goals to be out the same year, so at the end of construction in 2022. Mindful that Mother Nature may often not want to play nice, so there are site conditions for safety that may make it uh, not happen, but the goal and everyone's intent is to get all this done in 2022. Truck access for material movement. So all the dump trucks and all stuff that's going to be there, that's going to come off of Route 44 exit. So if you saw some trees cut down, if you get off the exit coming south, that was in preparation for building an access road. And then another component of the plan, there's a com community involvement component here. And so that's kind of what we're doing here. It's not defined uh, in... It, there's no regimented way to do that. So I guess if, if when we start the Q&A here, if they think of ways to stay engaged, what, what would be the best ways that you can think of that we would maintain the ability to share information with you? Because this is ultimately going to be your project as residents and not necessarily mine. I'm, I'm kind of working through it right now because that's my job at the Ohio EPA. But when we, we are done, this is your area. So how would you like us to communicate um, this to you with the museum, the city? They both have, we're able to get the press releases out. So we can talk about that because it, that, again, there's nothing set. And I, I'm kind of willing to do what you folks think works best. And, and that's where we are. So at this point, I will take questions if you have anything else. Yeah. So the question was, what's kind of going to happen after, after this is done? Um, the answer is maybe. <laughs> so the intent is, remember, to recreate some of that river valley. But in the, in the gross big picture, this is a massive removal of contaminated material. The fine details of the actual restoration, that'll be another project that is not part of us that will likely be the museum. Chances are we would fund it or Great Lakes uh, Restoration Initiative would fund it because I think the museum would love to see this. I mean, it's part of their property. It's part of the marsh. They would like to see it all work together. So not directly in this one, but the gross footprint should be ready.